Okay, maybe let's get it started. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this presentation entitled Consumer Driven Contracts to Enable, uh, enable API Evolution. Uh, my name is Martin Jeistrak. So, who has been to Josh's talk? Josh Long? Okay, so you already know what Pivotal is, what Spring is. Who is using Spring Cloud? Okay, quite a few people, awesome. So, uh, my name is Marcin Grzyszczak. I am uh, working at the Spring Cloud team uh, at Pivotal, and I'm mostly working on those three projects, Sleuth, Contract, and Pipelines. Sleuth is for distributed tracing, Contracts, we're gonna talk about this today, and Pipelines is about um, continuous integration delivery and deployment. My Twitter handle is at mgrzyszczak, sorry for the foreigners. Uh, if I were you, I would pick four letters, at least, like from the beginning, and that's it. Most likely, you're gonna find me. Or go to my blog, toomuchcoding.com, where uh, you can find my Twitter handle, for example. Okay, so what's on the agenda? Like in high school, introduction, some demo, and summary. Uh, one more thing, there is a small chance, but it might happen, that my computer will just freeze, because it happened twice yesterday. Uh, so if that happens, a friend of mine borrowed her computer, so I'm going to use that one, but no demo then. Okay, so uh, before we go any further, uh, let's define what we will not talk about, because that's really critical. So may I have your attention, please? We will not be talking about these things, like schemas, weasels, ESBs, XSDs, XSLTs, and any other stuff like that. Actually, I think I'm going to use the word schema one more time during this talk saying that what I'm showing you is not a schema. That's basically it. So the idea of Spring Cloud Contract and consumer-driven contracts as such, and contract testing, is not to introduce unnecessary coupling between services or replicate old mistakes. That, that's not the case. So let us define some common terms, some common vocabulary, so we're on the same page. So a producer is a service that exposes an API or sends a message, right? So if you have a, an app, like a Spring app or whatever app, that has a uh, REST controller or a, 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 an app that sends a message, that's the producer. A consumer, it, it consumes the API or listens to a message from the producer, right? So you have a, for example, a REST template and you send a request or you have a messaging template and listen to a message, you're a consumer. Now, what is a contract? A contract is an agreement between the producer and the consumer on how the API message will look like. But this is not a schema, so this is the moment I use the word schema. Uh, we are talking about a scenario-based communication, right? Not give me all the fields, like request fields, and give me all the response fields. I don't care. It's a request-response uh, way of defining this agreement. Now, what are consumer-driven contracts? It's an approach where the consumer drives the changes of the API of the producer. It's interesting, because what typically happens is that the producer says, this is my API. And let's try to change this. Let's say that the consumer drives the change. But you're going to see that in a sec. So before you use any tool, like you go to a conference and somebody says, I have a silver bullet for you. I have a great tool. I have a great approach. It's going to, like, everything's going to be great. So the first thing you should ask yourself is, what problems are we trying to solve using this tool or this approach? So we're trying to solve two problems. The first one is stop validity and reusability in the integration tests. And the second one is creation of nice API. So let's start with the first one. Let's say that we have a typical situation, like you have on your, uh, at your daily work. You have a consumer app which is sending a request, HTTP request to a producer. It happens, right? So how can you test that? How will you write a test for it? I mean, assuming that you write tests, right? Uh, and of course, everybody does write tests here, right? Who's not writing tests? OK, quite a few people. That's good. This talk is for you. Uh, so what we can do is basically do the same, right? We start the consumer, we start the producer, and we do end-to-end -end tests. And it's not bad, but imagine that this producer over there is talking to other apps. So how many of them will you start? On your local machine, maybe, like 500 services? It doesn't scale. It's problematic. What about the database? Uh, every service has an like, in-memory database. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. 
So what you typically do, or you should do, is that you write a stub, right? A fake instance of the producer. Now the question is, who knows what Wiremock is? Wiremock, Wiremock, okay, quite a few people. So for the rest of you, Wiremock is a HTTP server stub written in Java, where you define the expected behavior in JSON files. So as a consumer, let's say that as a consumer, my name is Pivotal Calculator Service. So we're on the consumer side. In my tests, I define JSON files with, my expected, with the expected behavior of the other app. So it's crucial to like, see that the, it's the consumer that owns the stub definitions, right? The consumer. So how does JSON files look like? Yeah, this is one example. So we have a request and response. So assuming that you send a HTTP method, uh, like a post method to a URL history, the response will be status 201 and content type will be application JSON. Right, one example. Another one, uh, method post, URL history again. If you have in the body text six, six plus six, you get a response status 400. So it's more or less like in Mokito, like given a method was executed with those arguments, then respond with this. So you can do exactly the same in terms of stubbing the uh, HTTP calls. So now let us assume that we're introducing uh, a new endpoint, like, like the producer has uh, have introduced a new endpoint. Because doing a breaking change would be too easy, like obvious. Let's say that a new endpoint has been introduced. So you take a look at your email or Confluence page or phone the other like producers and they say like, hmm, I heard that you have a new endpoint. And they say, yeah, yeah, we have a new endpoint, please use it. Sure, right? Okay, so let us assume that this is the new endpoint that we heard over the phone or in an email. That if you send a me uh, like a message uh, with method post to URL called some non-existent URL, this is like, non uh, it's for a reason that the, the endpoint uh, is named like this. Uh, then respond with 201 and content type application JSON. Fair enough. That's what was written in the confluence on the wiki. So now what? As consumers, I'm writing the code to work with the new URL, URL right? So I'm typing my code, I'm sending that request, and my unit and integration tests pass because I wrote the stub and I said that if you send that message, respond with 200, right? So now I deploy the app to an environment where I have some like real integration taking place, some end-to-end. -end. And of course, obviously, I have nothing to worry, right? Because my build is green, the tests have passed. So what can happen is this. Of course, it never happened to you, but it does happen in, in other companies. Uh, so what went wrong? The problem is that the stubs that were used in the build phase, so written by the consumers, might have nothing to do with the real API. I mean, I can write whatever I want because I'm the consumer, I write the stub, and I'm calling the stub, right? So inside the test, I send an HTTP uh, call, and my stub send an, an OK back, right? Because I told it to do so, right? But in production, in reality, what can happen is that, for example, I made a typo in the URL, or I made a typo in the, in the field somewhere in the, in, the, in the model, and disaster happens, right? Another example with messaging, and th that one is really, really interesting. So the same, the stops can have nothing to do with the, re uh, with the reality. So with HTTP, the case is very simple because you send a message, uh, like you, you send an HTTP message, you have to block until you get the response, any response, right? And with messaging, suddenly something like triggers something, and in the end of which a message appears on the queue. Right, and then as a consumer, you oh you see oh there's a message, so I'm going to process it. So here in the test, you have to trigger a, like a fake message to some topic. Let's call it bar, for instance. And the consumer says, oh, I can see the message. But the great thing about this is that typically, like what the consumer does is that for a message, the consumer creates a pojo, right? That's what you do, and you use the very same pojo to trigger a fake message. So you might have a typo in the POJO. Your tests will pass because you're using the very same POJO to send the message and to receive it. And you won't check anything against like real life. So here, in the reality, like two things can happen. First one, 
the producer is not sending a message to bar, it's sending to foo. And the consumer is waiting for messages at bar. Just one thing. And even if you have proper topic names, if, if that would be like bar or whatever, you might have some serialization problems because the message that you're getting is different to the one that you created in your Pojo. So let's sum up the problems with stops. Typically, stops reside with the consumer. And why, like if you're using Mokito, it's working? Because you're mocking your own code. You're not mocking like the producer's code. It's in your code base. So the compiler tells you, like, yeah, everything is fine. Like the arguments are okay. This is a different case. Now the consumer controls the stubbing process, so it, the consumer can write whatever like bullshit it wants, right? Whatever. And the tests are gonna pass. So how are you sure that the stubs are still valid? Yep, I mean at this point you can't. You would have to check the code all the time. Another thing, what if other teams want to reuse those stubs? It's typically uh, happening when you have a sun-like architecture, so you have a monolith in the middle, or like a big app in the middle, and there are like plenty of other apps trying to get the data from this thing in the middle. And every single team has to repeat the very same process of creating stubs of the thing inside. So it would be great to have stubs that you can share. So another thing with messaging, how are you sure that you're listening to the proper topic or queue, if the name is correct, or that you have like your project is proper, that you can deserialize the message. Now the nice API creations, that was one thing. Now what about the other? A consumer is called a consumer for a reason, because it consumes the API, right? So the producer typically doesn't call itself, except for the demos. So it's the consumer that does it. So the consumers should take part in the creation of the API of the producer, of course, until a certain like, number of consumers, right? Twitter, I guess, it would be impossible for them to agree with every single consumer of their API. So it would be great if the consumers could take part in the creation of the API because they are using it. So the producer's API chain should be driven by consumers because they know what they want. Now, if you don't cooperate, like things like this can happen. For instance, for sure you can see that integration tests have passed here, right? Whereas the, in, you know, uh, the, the integration tests, I don't think so. The same here. Uh, let's say that those three fields are OK, but here there's a typo in here as well. So then you have a problem. So the potential answer to this problem might be sprinkle contract. So, yeah, so that was the introductory part. Now we're going to talk about uh, like concrete stuff, so demo. So what are we going to code? Uh, we're going to have a consumer app that is actually a service that gets beer requests. We can say that it's like a waiter. Somebody comes to the bar and says, I want a beer. But the waiter doesn't know if that person is eligible to get the beer. So th the waiter has to go to the manager and ask, hey, can he get the beer? So the manager is going to be the producer. So it's the service that checks if the client is old enough to buy the beer. And for the sake of this demo, let us assume that you're old enough when you're 20 plus, because it's easier to write a regular expression, OK? So let's stick with that. Uh, and now the feature is like, if the user is too young, the beer will not be sold. Otherwise, the beer will be granted. So yeah, there's the consumer, the producer. A guy comes to a bar, it's like a joke, right? A guy comes to a bar and says, I'm 22, give me a beer. And the consumer asks the producer, can he get the beer? The answer is yes. So we're like, in real life, there you go. And the other scenario, I'm 17, give me a beer. Can he get the beer? No, and then like in real life, you get lost. So this is, these are like two cases that we're going to code. Now who is who? Uh, it would be best, like, to either use two different laptops. Hopefully, I won't have to use the other one. But like, in order to show who is the consumer, who is the producer, I've invented, bless you, I invented such a case that the consumer uses, when, whenever you see a black terminal or black IDE, is a consumer, OK? Whenever you see a white terminal or white IDE, that's the producer. I'm going to shout like I'm on the consumer side in the, in the, in the meantime. So hopefully, you'll see that. Now, so we're going to have, like, the phase, first phase is going to be the consumer's offline work. Because the consumer will work, like, offline to play around with the API of the producer 
in order to like pick the contract, like define the contracts uh, with the API that will suit their needs. Once the agreement is reached, how the co contract should look like, the producers, uh, the, the producer can write the, the missing feature. So it can work in parallel. The moment you agree on a contract, you can work in parallel. And once the producer has finished, uh, the consumer can switch to online mode. So you're going to see why in a sec. So the first flow will look like this. We have the consumer over here. And we have the produ producer that uh, contains the contracts, because the contracts will lay with the producer, not with the consumer. That's the change. The consumer will clone the producer's code. It might sound, sound bizarre, but that's, that's for a reason. So the consumer clones the producer's code and will play around with the contracts. Remember, the contracts define the API uh, that the consumers want to use. And once the, um, the contracts are defined by the consumer in the way that satisfy the consumer's needs, a PR will be filed to the producer. Now time for the demo. Hopefully demo gods will be good for me. OK, black ID, the consumer side. Oh, sorry, black terminal, the consumer side. So what do we have here? Let's check out the test. So we have beer controller test. This is my commented out code that you should see. OK. So consumer driven contracts can be like called TDD on the level of architecture. Uh, so obviously, we should start with a test. I don't have time to write everything. So I have like the skeleton of the test already created. And I have some implementation done already. So we have two tests. First one is should give me a beer when I'm old enough, and the other should reject a beer when I'm too young. Right? These are the two scenarios that we have. And inside the beer controller, I have a one method, which is like a post method with a URL beer that accepts application JSON. And I have a pojo here that has a name and an age. That's it. As simple as that. So let me write the body of the uh, one more, more important thing. Let us assume that the name of the app is full consumer. It's going to be needed like afterwards. So I'm going to write my mock MVC test, which is going to be done by copy pasting, because for sure I would make 55 mistakes in the meantime. OK. Two imports. OK. OK. So what we have here is please send a uh, JSON message to the beer endpoint, the one that I've shown you, uh, with um, a person named Marcin H22. And the result should be, there you go, right? This is the expected content. And in the case where somebody's too young, the result should be get lost. So now if we, uh, if we run this, what will happen is hopefully it is going to fail. If it passes, then we have a problem. OK, it failed. Obviously, it failed for a reason, because I returned nil, right? So we send a request. I, I got nil. And yeah. I should get, for example, get lost, and I got nil, right? So now, over here, I will, I, will, I will use REST template to send a message to the producer. But actually, I have absolutely no idea yet how the API should look like. I don't know. I want to play around with this. I don't want to ask the producer to prepare something, uh, wait for them to do it, and then I'm going to try it out. So at this point, I'm going to clone the producer's code. OK, so I'm on the consumer side. You can see the folder called consumer, the black terminal. So I'm going to clone the producer's code. Since I don't believe in the internet during conferences, I'm cloning some other folder from my drive. And right now, I'm going to open the project. It's somewhere around here. Producer clone, and it's this guy. OK. Open this project in a new window. Hopefully, the dependencies will get resolved. So in the meantime, I can show you that um, I have a POM XML that contains one very important thing, which is the Spring Cloud contract plugin. Right? So at this point, the producer code has a plugin, Spring Cloud contract Maven plugin attached. And let's not look into the configuration, because it doesn't really matter for, at this moment. In the pro uh, oh, I have to clone a different branch, sorry. Check out clone. 
Okay, so I have absolutely no production code over here, nothing, just a pro producer's application, that's it, nothing, no production code. And I have a test folder here, and this is an important folder for me, since I'm using Spring Cloud Contract. So I have source test resources contracts and a full consumer folder. So you can see that it's like for a reason, because my name, like as a consumer, my name is Fu Fu Consumer. I have a REST folder, and over here, right now, I'm going to define my first contracts. So the first contract will be called should grant a beer if old enough. In Spring Cloud Contract, you define contracts using Groovy DSL. This is one of the possibilities, and I'm going to show you that. Groovy. Okay. For those who, like already, when I said Groovy, want to leave, don't do it yet, because there's nothing dynamic going on around here. It's fully statically typed. So I'm going to define my contract like this. I'm doing contract make, whoops. So this is the first closure. Now, I'm going to define some description of the, the whole scenario. So it's going to be like represents, it can be useful for the BAs, for instance. Represents a successful, so, oh, successful scenario of getting a beer. Now we can do a BDD style thing, like given client is old enough when he applies for a beer, then we'll grant him a beer, right? Whatever. Now we define a request and the respo response blocks, right? Request, response. So here, we can start playing with this API. Let's say, and I'm right now simulating that I'm wondering how the API should look like, but it's already prepared for the demo, so yeah. So the first thing, I'm defining a method, post. Let's say that I would like to send a, uh, this post to some URL. Let's call it, for example, check. Why not? Now the body. In Groovy, um, like JSON structure maps to a map, basically, right? You have keys and values or lists of stuff. So you can use a Groovy map notation to define the body in a very nice way. For example, like this. So the age would be 22, and the name will be oh, Marcin. Like this. So right now, I've defined a sample JSON, or a sample map, that I would expect uh, to be sent in the body. And now, time for the headers. So this is my header. Content type application JSON. So we've got the request. So what should happen if I get such a request? Status should be 200. Uh, body. So one way of defining the body is using the map notation, but you can also use the triple quotes thing from Groovy. So for those who don't know Groovy, if you define, uh, like it's a multi-line string, so you don't have to escape anything in the middle. So I'm going to just write the JSON that I would like to have uh, returned. Oops, like this. Let's say that in this case, when somebody's old enough, I want to get this JSON. State is OK. And now headers, content type, application JSON. Voila, that's it. We've got our first contract. It wasn't that bad, I guess. So I'm going to copy this and create the second one. So should reject a beer if too young. So it represents a, an unsuccessful scenario. When a client is too young, will not grant him the beer. And now he's 17. And let's say that the status is not OK. Right? So now, as a consumer, I said, let's say that this is the API that I would like to call. Why not? So now, I'm going to do what everybody does on, with their code. I'm going to run maven clean install skip tests. So I'm in the cloned producer's code, and I'm running clean install skip tests, and I'm doing it for a reason. So if we go up over here, you can see that the Spring Cloud contract Maven plugin does something. And basically, 
if we go down, from the contract, it defines two stops. Two stops. And let's check out those stops. Okay. So if we go to target, under stops, we will see two stops. Should grant a beer if old enough? Rings a bell? So these are wire mock stops. So from the contract, which is written with a nice, groovy, statically typed DSL, we have created a wire mock stub. It is kind of intelligent because it also parses the body and converts it into a list of JSON paths. Believe me, JSON paths are not nice to work with, so it's done for you out of the box. So here you can see that if you send the post method to URL check, and the content type uh, header is application JSON, and the body contains a JSON field called name that is equal to, has, has a value equal to margin, and an age equal to 22, then the response will be status OK, and uh, the status 200 and body with status uh, OK. And the other thing that I have done over here with uh, the plugin is that I have installed the stubs locally in my Maven local. Right? So the group ID is com example. The artifact ID, I'm kind of bad at naming, is called beer API producer with stops per consumer. And the version is 001 snapshot. Okay? So right now, as a consumer, I said, okay, this API seems okay. Let's check it out. So we go back to the consumer's code, right? Consumer's code. We have this missing controller thing. We should send a request to the producer. And now I have a like, simulation of the API that I would like to call. As you can see, the consumer is driving the whole process, right? So let me just copy the, the code from here. Uh, okay, so now I'm using REST template to send a message with a method post, content type, application JSON, and a body person, which is having name and age. Oh, sorry. And I expect to have a response that is going to have a status field. Uh, and the response will be, there you go, if everything is OK. And if not, it's going to be get lost, right? So who thinks that if I run this test, it's going to pass? Who is not sleeping? OK, quite a few people. That's good. So obviously, it's not going to pass because I'm going to get a conne connection refused because I'm sending a real request and I get connection refused because I, I, I sent a request to localhost 8090. There's nothing there. And now the magic comes in. Spring Cloud contract on the consumer side. So I'm going to use something called a stub runner. I actually lied to you. I'm, I'm typically bad at naming, but this name is good. Stub runner is used to run stubs. So I'm saying, this is the stub that I would like you to find Group ID is com example. The artifact ID is beer API producer with stubs per consumer. Plus means latest version. Stubs is classifier. And register it at port 8090. So it's exactly, I, I want this uh, stub that has been just installed in my Maven local. Work offline means pick my Maven local. Don't go to any artifactory nexus or anything. And this is the new feature, which means that and take only those stubs that are mine. So in the path, there's going to be a full consumer. So if I run this, and hopefully it will, it will work. Please, I beg you. Yes, Jesus. OK, so it worked. Why? Let me show you why. Uh, Ether, yeah. So over here, Sprinkle Contracts comes into play and says, if you can see anything, yeah. So it says that I'm going to search for stubs in my Maven local. Uh, you said I want that you want a plus. So it means that I'm going to use the latest version. And it says, oh, I found in the Maven local a version 001 snapshot. And what it did, it started at in-memory wire mock HTTP server, fed it with stubs, and started it at port 8090, which you can see over here. Right, 8090, it started over here. So now, if I change this to full consumer 2222, 20, 
If I run this again, it should fail because I'm using the feature stops per consumer, which means only the stops related to me with the name full consumer are those that I care about. Good. Now, it's, I told you that it's TDD, so green, uh, no, red, green refactor, the other way around. So now we are at the, at the, uh, we are at, at the red, now we are at green, time to refactor. Because in my opinion, sending the name is kind of stupid. I mean, who cares about the name? Why, why should I send the name uh, in order to check if the person can get the beer? So I don't want to send it. I'm going to create a new class, like a, uh, let's call it, I don't know, beer request. And I'm not going, oops, I am not going to send that name. Let's go up. And over here, I'm going to send the beer request with age only. So let's run this again. Okay. And now it's failing. Why is it so? If we check this out, Wiremocked says, uh, first thing, it's, it's sending back uh, 404. Why is it so? Because Wiremocked says, you send me a message with a URL check, headers are OK, but the body is age 17, right? And I have a stub that is the closest match that expects also the name. So if you have defined that you need the name in the contract and it's not provided, then you're not, like, uh, the request is not going to be matched. So any sort of typos will be caught immediately that, hey, I mean, you're sending me something, but I don't get it, so 404. So let's fix it. I'm going back to the pro uh, producer's code, and I'm going to remove the, the name. I don't like it. And now, another thing. I have hard-coded the age. Maybe the age is not the best like an example, but let us assume that it's not age, it's, a, it's time, or database identifier. So it's difficult, it's feasible, but it's difficult to hard code time in your tests just to send it, like, to, you know, to, to, to match it. So we can have dynamic uh, values here as well. There is a number of ways to do it. I'm going to do it in the easiest way, in my opinion. So I'm going to call a fabulous method called a dollar, because I can. And I'm going to pass a regular expression here. So like I told you, let's make it simple. So if you want to get the beer, you have to be 20 plus. So if the age matches the regular expression, which is like the first digit is toward, uh, from 2 to 9 and the other from 0 to 9, then you get the beer. If not, oops, let's go here. I'm, I know that it's not always going to work with the 0 in, at the beginning, but let's ignore this. And let's install the stops again. So I've changed the contracts. Let's install the stops again. OK. And if we check out the target, if we check out the stops, we'll see that the JSON path has changed to a regular expression. Believe me, it's a regular expression in JSON path. So now, if I go back to the, uh, to the code over here, test code, I'm going to change the age to 65 and to 13 over here. So if I run this, hopefully, the test will pass because the name is not necessary anymore. And yes, yes. And the age matches a regular expression. So at this point, as a consumer, I'm happy with the API. The contracts are OK. I'm filing a PR to the producer. Now let's go back to the presentation. So now the producer flow will look like this. The producer takes over the PR, right, with the contracts. So this, uh, the consumer says, hey, these are the contracts that we'd like you to fulfill. Of course, they were in touch. It's not like suddenly you file a PR with 200 contracts saying, eh, I mean, we have a deadline tomorrow. Please like, do it. Uh, so no. Uh, the producer writes the missing implementation. And then once the code is merged, uh, the CI tooling uploads the fab jar and the stops to some remote location like Artifactory or Nexus. So let's do it. So now 
I'm changing the color to white, the producer. And this is also the producer. Producer. Let me close these. OK. Am I on a proper branch? Yes, I guess so. OK. Yeah. So uh, let us assume that we got those contracts over here, right? Uh, I'm going to add three uh, quotes over here. You're going to see why in a sec. Well, it's going to be uh, looking nicer. OK, and OK. So right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in the producer's code, run maven clean install. So uh, one more thing, I have no, almost no implementation over here. I just return nil. So whatever I get as a request, I just return nil. And I have only base classes for tests. Ignore this one. I, have, I don't have any tests, right? So I'm running maven clean install. And suddenly, I have failing tests. Two failing tests. Why is it so? So this is the other thing that uh, Sprinkle contract does. It can generate tests from your contracts. So if you go to the uh, target, contracts, etc., you'll see a REST test class. Oops. Should grant a beer old enough, rings a bell. So this is the name of the contract. Two methods are created. So if we said that we're going to send a post method with content type application JSON to a endpoint called check, and we expect status to 100, content type application JSON, and a status OK, we are actually doing that. So we're preparing a request with the header, with the body. We set, we set a regular expression. So we are generating that value from this regular expression, because you have to send a real piece of information, right? And we're sending the post to URL check. And we're checking the response back. So if I run this, and I can run this from my ID, it's not going to work. Boom. So what I can do is write some missing implementation. And what I have here is a person checking service. It's an interface. So from the point of view of a controller, what I'm going to do is do this simple check. So if the person checking service should get a beer for person to check is true, then I want to return uh, response OK. And otherwise, I want to, whoops, I want to return state is not OK. As you can see, I mean, this is just an interface, right? Sprinkle, uh, I mean, consumer driven contracts are not about checking the functionality, they are about checking the, if we can communicate, it's about checking the API. So if over here, you would be checking the database or sending yet another request. Don't do it. I mean, it's not, it's not the tool for this. So that's why we're using an interface here. And in the generated test, you can see that there is an extension. So it extends beer rest base class. So the generated test, uh, you can configure it in a number of ways. I'm not going to go into details of that need to extend some class, because you have to set up the context and stuff like that. So let's check out the, uh, the base class. So over here, what we're doing is that we're using Mokito J runner. Uh, this is my object under test, system under test, producing controller. And I have a mock of a person ch checking service. And over here, I'm mocking the interface as, like specifically for the contract tests. So I'm saying that. If that interface is called with an argument that the person is old enough, then please return true. Otherwise, return false. So over here, I have a type uh, safe matcher that just checks if person uh, to check age is 20. And now I'm going to run this. Uh, so I have a, break, a couple of breakpoints, hopefully. OK. Oops. It's going to be better over here. Let me run this again. OK, so we're about to send the post method. Uh, yeah, the post method to URL check. We're using mock MVC and rest assured. We're over here. The person to check has age 53. And now we will be redirected to Mokito, to the type safe matcher, that will check if the person to check age is 20. If that's the case, we should be in the status OK. 
and the test will pass because we have fulfilled uh, the requirements of the contract. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run clean install again. So it's going to regenerate the contract, uh, sorry, it's going to regenerate the tests and run them against my written implementation. And now I have a success, right? The tests have passed. So this was what we were supposed to do on the producer side, right? Now to finish the flow, so the, con the, the producer has uh, written the implementation, it's fulfilling the contracts, it's been merged to master, and the jar with the stubs and with the contracts has been pushed to some nexus or artifactory. So now the consumer can switch to online work. What does it mean? So if we go here to the consumer side, black IDE, I'm writing that instead of working offline, I'm providing repository root, which means that the stubs reside under my.nexus.com, whatever, right? And that way, when you run the test, the stubs will be fetched from the, that location, uh, or, and, the, um, and your test will be executed against those stubs. So whenever, in this case, when, like the latest stubs that any other app has produced, uh, those stubs will be fetched. Okay. So now you can say, are you mad? One does not simply clone somebody else's repo. You're insane. We can't even, security doesn't let us do it. No problem. You can keep the contracts in the dedicated repo. The flow looks in a, like a very same way. It's simplified. So instead of keeping the contracts at the, at the producer side, you have separate repo with certain structure and the consumer plays around with those contracts and then the producer takes over like the PR, that's it. Like this is the only change. So instead of having the producers with the, co with, uh, the contracts with the producer, you have them in a separate repo. Another thing you can say, hmm, I have the contracts, they're telling the truth because we're testing those contracts against the producer. So maybe let's create a living documentation out of it. And this is a very good thing. So if I go over here to my, uh, to my target, I have generated snippets and I wrote like a piece of code, a test that like searches, searches for all the contracts and creates an ASCII doctor format file with all of the contracts. So it says what the name of the file is, the description and how the contract looks like. It was like Poorman's version of the proper documentation, but you can feel the power that if you store all the contracts in a single repo, then you can create a living documentation of the whole system in no time. Oh yeah, it looks like this. And you can say, I hate Groovy. You, think you haven't convinced me, I hate it, no, no way. No problem, you can use sprinkler contract wiremock with ResDocs. Who knows ResDocs? Okay, quite a few people. So Spring ResDocs allows you to use the mock MVC thing that we have used and now, on the producer side, you can, instead of defining the uh, contract from which the tests are generated, you as a producer can write the test yourself. Fair enough. And then you can write, verify, it comes from a sprinkler contract, and tell how the stub should look like. So whatever has happened in your test will result in creating a stub. So you have plenty of options. Also, right now, we introduced the pluggability, so you can create like a contract in YAML if you want to, it's not a problem. Okay, summary. With sprinkler contract and consumer-driven contracts, we've been able to achieve the following. We've created an API that suits the uh, needs of the consumer and the producer. Uh, they were talking with each other, and they defined a contract that is acceptable for both sides. And expectations were defined by readable contracts and expectations were tested against the producer. This is the key thing that we wanted to solve, the key problem, right? The reusability and the validity of stubs. Uh, yeah, the producer stubs can be reused by consumers because they are uh, sent uh, to Nexus or Artifactory. Starting and setting of stubs is fully automated. You didn't have to do anything. You just annotate your test class. Right? Should you consider using sprinkler contract? Because you also can do the same with messaging. Uh, because we allow using clear and easy to use statically typed DSL, we automatically generate tests because I know that developers write tests, but also good developers should be lazy and sometimes those two things don't go into play together. Uh, and we have the stub runner functionality that allows you to run stubs. And 
The thing is that you can download the stops from Nexus Artifact or your local Maven instance, uh, local, Maven, local Maven cache, or it's the new thing. You can take them from ClassPath. So instead of providing like fetch those from uh, Nexus, you can provide this as a dependency, as a test dependency with special format, like also structure folders, and we're going to pick it, uh, like pick it automatically. If you're using Spring Cloud, uh, we are stubbing out service discovery. So you can still use service discovery, and we're going to delegate your call to the fake Wiremock instance. It's transparent for you. And there's also StubRunner boot. So if you're using, for example, some other language, like I don't know, JavaScript, whatever, uh, you can run the stubs by running Java jar on a fat jar of an app. And that's it. It's going to download the stubs and run them for you. It can also register those stubs in a real Eureka or uh, send real messages to a, to a real RabbitMQ or something like that. So what is new in Spring Cloud Contract? If you have seen this talk or in, uh, are interested in the topic, we have defined in the Dalston release train, so versions 1.1x, pluggable architecture, so you can define your own way of defining contracts. We support out of the box Groovy and Pact, uh, but you can define YAML, you can do whatever you want. Uh, picking up stops, class buff uh, scanning, downloading from Nexus, you can customize that. You don't have to use WireMock, it comes out of the box. You can use Moco, whatever, whatever you want. And the way you generate tests. I know there's one company that is already working on the PHP stuff. Sorry for them. And, but you can define like whatever you want. And you can pick stops from the class path. You have the stops per consumers option, which I've shown you. Uh, it's really fresh stuff. Uh, you can reference requests from response. So if you need to, in the response, have exactly one part of the request, you can do it. It's no problem. And instead of using the magical dollar method, you can provide a separate section for stop, like for the request part and from the response part, where you define the dynamic bits. So if you're more, if you're interested, you can read the docs. So this is like the link to the docs. You can check out the samples. Uh, the thing that you saw today, uh, the code is in the samples, and you can talk to to us on Gitter, Spring Cloud slash Spring Cloud Contract. Please fill out the survey about the talk because I would like to make it better, so your feedback is crucial, like in the open source. So you can take a picture of this if you want to, or just come after the talk and tell me that it was terrible. Uh, and time for questions. I'm going to leave this for you to take, take a picture or something. Any questions? No questions? Oh, there is a question. Good. Oh, there's another one. Uh, I wonder if this resolution have any uh, downsides. This is a question, right? Yes. Okay. Um, it has because uh, let's say that I mean you have to take care of the contracts. For example, this is one one thing. Um, let us assume that uh, you already have some way of defining. Uh, let, well, let me rephrase it. So let, let's say that you already have a lot of tests. So right, and, and the big API. So now imagine that you have to sit down and write a contract for every single one. It's a downside, but on the other hand, since you haven't done this until now, all the integration tests on the consumer side, which are stopped by the stops that reside with the consumers, they can be deleted, actually, because those stops don't have to do anything with the reality. So it's a downside because you have to put some work, uh, but it, it makes sense. And another thing is that some, for some people, the process can be confusing. That's why you don't have to necessarily do the consumer-driven contract approach, so the, so the consumers are driving the change. But you can do, for example, the producer contract once, which means that, OK, I have so many consumers that I'm just going to define the API, right? Oh, this is, it has to be like this. For example, Josh today said start.spring.io, right? So the Spring Initializer, we, we as Spring, we're eating our own dog food. So Spring Initializer is using Spring Cloud Contract, but in the producer contract way. So we have REST doc tests from which we're genera generating stubs. And then you as a potential consumer can download those stubs from repo.spring.io and write tests if you want to integrate with us, right? So 
it depends on like your use case, but you have to invest some time to understand the topic, and you have to uh, invest some time to, to, to write the contracts or like rewrite your tests, for example, to ResDoc tests. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool, thanks. Another question? Yeah, over there, to the top. It is possible to use already generated Swagger documentation? That's a perfect question. So I tried to do that. Uh, I completely failed, and that's for a reason. I tested that with Swagger and Raml. Raml is in the incubator, Spring Cloud incubator, I guess. Why is it, in my opinion, very difficult, to say the least? That's because Swagger defines a schema, right? And this is not a schema. I need, for certain data, input data, I need certain output data. So I need something like an example, and in RAML you have it. You have a section like example. But why is uh, RAML integration not in core? That's because I think that most people don't use RAML in the way I would like them to use for the contracts to work, right? So that's why it's like, if you, want, if you really need to use RAML, you have to like create one, a single RAML file for every scenario you have and put it into examples. So basically, the only advantage you have is that you're using, advantage in theory, that you're using YAML. That's it. So I tried that. I really tried. There's an issue uh, on GitHub. There is a pull request I had to close. I talked to the community and said, I don't know how to do it to make it work like properly because because of this is a schema, basically. Does that answer your question? Yes, of course. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? I don't see, I guess. Okay, thank you very much. If you want to talk, just come here and let's talk. And if not, we can talk later. And if not, just don't ask any questions. <laughs> Thanks.